This is a short list of things I think about worshipping. I think about how our body works and how all the little pieces work in tandem, and the relationships we have with them. Zombie movies always focus both narratively and visually on the head and teeth. Romance focuses on the heart metaphorically and the face visually, because there's so much to garner in just how we look at each other. My mother taught me value in tangibility, and that always started at the skin. The most direct way of caring for someone started at the roots of their scalp, the edges of their elbows, and the curve of their fingernails. I have this big caricature in my head of all my aunts tending to each other's hair across lines of chairs because it felt like that's what we did in the family. The, the literal surface of a person was a garden to tend to. Even to this day, I, I can't think of any better way to love someone than by offering to clip their nails, moisturize their arms, and comb their hair. Your skin is the largest organ that you have. It's got such a busy job of keeping everything together. It cracks at the seams when there's too much beauty to contain. It leaks when you're hot and puckers when you're cold. It makes up so much of what you are visually that the idea of getting to care for it feels... It feels like an act of worship. There's so much skinship in society. It's, it's hugely important to our camaraderie, our identity, and our intimacy. If I'm combing your hair, it's because there's a piece of you that is godly. Within you, some amount of divinity resides, and it would be my genuine privilege to tend to that. I worship skin. Art is my favourite language to speak in because I feel like it says more than words really can. I've always, always struggled with understanding and considering others' feelings. Some of my best relationships, both platonically and romantically, have ended due to a lack of mutual understanding. Communication within art has helped me in, in some parts. At, at times, the poetry and songs are easier to understand than the conversations. When you boil it down with animals, with the same stinky animal feelings, feelings that we've been mulling over for millennia, but somewhere between all of these dumb monkey instincts, we started channeling it and producing things with all of these stinky animal vibes. We tapped our feet and we swallowed blood, soil, and bones into canvases of earth and we told stories. Most art is fundamentally useless. It fulfills no direct survival need. A Starry Night Sky by Vincent van Gogh has not fed anyone, but as human beings we've given the practice of art great significance. We have this relationship with design, uh, the application of skill, beauty, and self-expression. It's even in our mental chemistry. Just applying effort to a cohesive end result will give your brain a reward. When you finish a drawing or finish writing a song, your brain pats you on the back. Even if you're not making it yourself, just surrounding yourself with beautiful things is proven to improve your head chemistry. Whether you dance or draw or cook or write or play the glockenspiel, humans are dedicated to the development and appreciation of all of these pursuits and all of these products. I, I don't even have to give you the sciency jargon around its benefits, I can just comfortably say art is cool. <laughs> I think it's a noble cause, and for that, I worship art. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. Why they changed it, I can't say. People just liked it better that way. So the power of what we say is the most underrated tool. All species have some form of communication, and a quick Google search will tell you that primates, parrots, and dolphins have all been capable of working with the concept of human language, but obviously never mastering it. Humans are the only real species with language, and the complex way we can illustrate and record concepts using it has been a colossal game changer in our dominion over the world around us. So it's baffling to me that people don't realize the power that comes with being an effective communicator, or even just being a bit more considerate with what we say and how we say it. The feats of influence caused by Dr. Martin Luther King and Adolf Hitler are two sides of the same coin. The capacity to inspire and communicate concepts can shape land messes. And even on a more basic level, if you speak English, there are 983 million people who can be directly moved by what you have to say. And if you pick up Mandarin, that adds another 1.1 billion people. Learning a single additional language 
opens your door to hundreds of millions. It's both colossal and tiny. If you added Hindustani, Spanish, and Arabic to your skill set, which with English and Mandarin would make up the five most spoken languages, then the resulting three billion plus people that you can speak to is now still less than half of the world's population. Human interaction and cooperation is a fundamental of our lives, and I think we take it for granted. I have a great deal of respect for linguists, translators, interpreters, polyglots, and sometimes just kids with different nationality parents because I feel like they're all superhuman. These people are all living intersections between culture and that's something I really want to celebrate. There are public speakers and therapists who will bridge the mental barriers between talking to people and then there's translators and interpreters who will bridge the physical barriers between talking to people. And all of this complexity behind communication and language just boggles my head. My personal way of of having a relationship with language is by exploring its application. I like poetry, I like public speaking, and I like linguistics. Those are my favorite ways to interact with the experience of language as a wider concept, but overall, I'm hoping that just by believing in its power, I can bolster mine and others' ability to coexist. I worship language. I said that I don't mind if you hate me. Cause baby, if I were you... There's a concept in art called negative space. It's the part of the drawing that doesn't have anything drawn in it. It's the gaps between the line work, it's the empty backdrop, and it's, it's what is blank. The negative space is still very much part of the wider picture, and in some cases, a very opportunistic artist will do something with that negative space. I think about how cluttered our brains are, how the age of social media has made us obsessed with our image and a prisoner to the approval that a couple of clicks can give us, I said looking at my diminishing subscriber count. But even off the internet, I feel like everyone skates by with like this mutual base level anxiety. We keep running through the day by day praying that our floor won't fall through on us. We hope that our heads will stay screwed on, that our support networks will stay in place, and even if the powers that be really don't have our best interests at heart, we hope that they won't hold the pursuit of happiness just too far outside our grasp. The quiet, in this case, is both literal and metaphorical. It's the negative space in our heads and in our schedules. It's whatever you do or however you feel when all of the voices switch off and the fog clears. I don't know about you, but I have this terrible habit of multitasking. I hate just doing one thing. I need a TV show next to my video games, or a podcast next to my exercise, or a YouTube video next to my breakfast. And this is mostly fine, but is not always the healthiest or the most qualitative way to approach what you're doing. Some things deserve or require 100% of your attention to get the most out of them. I love long train journeys with friends. The last one I had was with my sister for Christmas. I love it because the fact that I can't go anywhere or access my usual material distractions makes my brain shrink. I start to focus on the sights out of the window, the interaction between the other passengers and just connecting with whoever I'm with. My head goes quiet and the world around me feels more comfortable and beautiful. Some people will meditate, some will exercise, and some will take some crazy psychedelics, but we all have a way of finding something close to the feeling of the quiet. The quiet is that feeling of solidarity with the world around you, where your head is content and pragmatic, where your heart beats steady and true, and where your knees aren't buckling under the weight of what it means to just be alive. Just like the negative space in art, the breaks in our brain activity is still part of the whole, and that comfortable quiet when contrasted with all of this fucking noise. I worship the quiet. A video game can become boring when you lose your sense of progression. Even if you're putting in effort, things might feel like they're stagnating, your mind might become complacent, and you may question what's the point of investing your time. The same can often be said for life. Tedium, hardship, and the darker parts of nihilism can leave us feeling lost. It can grey our surroundings and it can occlude our vision. There's a curious concept that I've fallen in love with, and that is liminal spaces. Liminality is the strange mental state that you feel when you are between circumstances. 
a liminal space can be an actual real thing. Like a, a, a waiting room at a hospital is, is the bit between discovering an illness and curing an illness. A bus stop or a train station is the middle part of the journey. And the liminality within your head is the middle ground between what is subliminal and what is superliminal. And that feels really bloody weird. It's like waking up after a long nap, where there's just a couple of seconds where you can't distinguish your dreams from reality, and all the signals and information are being compartmentalised in their homes while your human operating system runs all of its background programs. What I've tried to do with the four things that I spoke about earlier was articulate why I think they are beautiful. And the reason why I did this is because I believe beauty is the best sort of liminality. Beauty is a vehicle that pushes you to your next inspiration. Whether it's purely visual or more sentimental, your relationship with beauty directly affects your relationship with the world around you. It's what pushes people to fall in love, it's what makes them want to clean up the oceans and write some jazz music. I'm chatting a whole load of rubbish, to be honest. I, I wanted to... I wanted to talk about something else. <laughs> if... It, if my time here was cut short, then I'd want to leave knowing that the people who were left behind were looking for a beautiful tomorrow. That's it, really. I want you to see that.